Okay, sounds good. So, uh, uh, welcome everyone uh, for this 27th online Spintronic seminar. The speaker today is uh, Dr. Sebastian Diaz, uh, and his talk will be about typological magnetic edge and corner states in skirmion crystals. Uh, Dr. Diaz earned his bachelor's and master's degrees at the University of Chile under the supervision of Professor Alvaro, Alvaro Nunez. He then moved to the University of California, San Diego with support from the International Fulbright Science and Technology Award and received a PhD degree in 2017 under the supervision of Professor Daniel Arovitz. Uh, during his doctoral studies, he also spent half a year as a graduate student intern at Los Alamos National Lab. Uh, currently, uh, Dr. Diaz uh, holds a postdoctoral position at the University of Basel uh, in the group of Professor Daniel Loss. Uh, so, as I said, his talk will be at, about uh, typological magnetic states and skirmion crystals. And please welcome uh, Sebastian Diaz. Thank you, Kirill, for the introduction. Um, I would like to begin by expressing my gratitude to Kirill and Chin for conceiving this forward thinking initiative. And, and um, I just want to say that we're all indebted to your hard work putting this online seminar uh, series together. Today, I am going to present results from a couple of our recent works on topological magnons in Skirman crystals. And I would like to begin introducing magnetic skirmions and anti-skirmions. These are nanoscopic, particle-like spin configurations that carry an integer topological charge. And I would like to explain that a bit better using these two examples shown on the left. Up top, there's the texture, the spin configuration of a nail skirmion, and below it, that of an anti-skirmion. And what's uh, relevant about these spin configurations is that they both have a core at which there's a spin pointing downward. And is, as we move radially outward, the spins rotate and eventually point upward. So what is topological about these spin configurations? Well, imagine bringing all those spins to their respective cores. You would end up with a situation as shown on the right. All the spins are pointing um, in all directions covering the unit sphere and the number of times that the spin configuration covers the unit sphere is a topological invariant called the topological charge, which in the continuum can be computed using that formula down there. Due to their um, nanoscopic size, um, enhanced stability due to their topological charge and efficient coupling to electromagnetic fields, magnetic skirmions and anti-skirmions have been considered as information carriers in future magnetic storage and logic devices. And also recently uh, in uh, non-conventional computing approaches such as neuromorphic and stochastic computing. I wanna point out here that um, these two examples, they carry a topological charge of magnitude one because they uh, cover the sphere once. And in fact, the anti-skirmion has an opposite sign of topological charge due to the winding of the in-plane component of the spins about the core. So even though today's talk is about skirmion crystals, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you about our recent work where we studied an interacting pair of a skirmion and an anti-skirmion in a bilayer system. As I said, because a skirmion and an anti-skirmion have opposite topological charge, they form a topological charge dipole. And upon applying a, uh, a time oscillating driven dri driving magnetic field, they launch spin waves, they radiate spin waves. And you can learn all the details about this work if um, you watch the 10th episode of the online Spintronic seminar series, which was given by uh, my colleague, Christina Sarudaki. Now enough of the advertisement, let's go back to my talk. So magnetic skirmion crystals have been observed in a variety of systems in bulk and thin film magnets, um, in metallic, uh, semiconducting, multiferroic, and also in Heusler compounds in the group of Stuart parking. 
um, in that case, uh, they observe a lattice of anti -scarmions. And uh, careful studies of the cooling protocol um, revealed that it's possible to um, enlarge the temperature and magnetic field range in which skarmion and anti skarmion crystals can be stabilized. Let me briefly switch gears and tell you about magnons and magnonics. Magnons are the quantum spin waves, and spin waves are collective modes of the magnetization field or the spin configuration. And um, because uh, spin waves, as they propagate, do not displace electric charges, they do not lead to dual heating, which is an important asset for the field of magnonics, which studies how to encode transmit and process information using spin waves. Our group in Basel has a long tradition of studying magnonic analogs of electronic transport. For instance, um, quantized magnonic conductance, uh, magnonic Hall effects in the presence of electric field gradients, taking advantage of the harnock cacher effect, and uh, just of some magnon currents between magnon both Einstein condensates, just to name a few. Fairly recently, people have predicted the existence of topological magnonic insulators. These are the magnonic analog of the more familiar topological, electric, uh, electronic topological insulators, whose key property, hallmark property, is that they support topologically protected magnonic edge states, which um, represent robust unidirectional channels for magnon spin currents that could be used in applications uh, in spintronics and magnonics applications. And topological magnonic insulators could be realized in, for example, engineered magnonic crystals as shown on the left in actual magnetic compounds as predicted by this article in the middle and as proposed by our group in Basel, they could also be realized in insulating ferromagnets and anti-ferromagnets, taking advantage either of the Hern of Kasher effect or the non-collinear spin texture of skirmish crystals. So I would like to make an important point before moving on. Uh, I've talked about magnetic texture and their topology in real space, which can be quantified using this topological invariant, the topological charge. But later on in this talk, I will be talking about magnons, uh, excitations of spatially periodic magnetic textures that can also be topological, but their topology belongs to reciprocal space where the invariants that can be computed to characterize them are the turn number or the quadruple moment, for example, and those are defined in reciprocal space. These two are distinct worlds, although there may be connections between them. Last year, we published uh, our first work on topological magnons in anti-ferromagnetic skirmish crystals. And we were very happy with that work because we made it to the cover of PRL. But today I will be focusing on our recent work on topological magnons in ferromagnetic skirmish crystals. So here I'm showing the texture of a ferromagnetic skirmish crystal, where you can identify uh, that the skirmions are forming a triangular lattice, a triangular crystal. Before moving on to the details, I would like to give you the main message of this first part of the talk, which is that skirmion crystals support topological edge states for robust magnetic field controllable magnet spin currents with reduced dual heating. And now I will spend a, a few minutes trying to convince you that this is true. So again, here I'm showing the ground state texture, classical texture of uh, the Hamiltonian shown uh, down there in the bottom. This is a spin lattice Hamiltonian, which has uh, from left to right, ferromagnetic exchange interaction to nearest neighbors, Yalashinsky-Murray interaction also to nearest neighbors. And finally, a coupling to an external magnetic field, which is pointing uh, outside of the screen. 
I should point out that the Yalshinsky marine interaction um, coefficients can be modified to model either ferromagnetic skirmish, as I'm doing it here, or uh, anti skirmish as I will be doing in the second part of the talk. And you can see there that in yellow, I have highlighted the magnetic unit cell of the skirmion crystal, which, com which is showing one single ferromagnetic skirmion, which is comprised of many spins. And since we're going to study magnons, I need to tell you briefly how we compute, construct spin weight Hamiltonian. So we start with um, the spin lattice Hamiltonian I just showed before. And we have a classical ground state texture, in this case, for instance, the ferromagnetic screen crystal. And we, since we want to describe local distortions of this texture, we need to introduce at each spin site a local basis. There's a known mapping that we take advantage of to Holstein Primakov bosons. And if we expand now our Hamiltonian written those Holstein Primakov bosons to quadratic order, and we take a Fourier transform, taking uh, into account that the system is spatially periodic, it's a crystal of skirmins, we end up with that spin wave Hamiltonian shown uh, on the right, which is then diagonalized using a Bogolubov transformation with a transformation matrix T sub K that gives us finally our spin wave Hamiltonian where uh, in the box equation, alpha dagger, alpha are the creation and annihilation operator of magnons. The labels are K, the crystal momentum, and lambda, which is the band index. There are as many bands as spins in the magnetic unit cell. And the uh, coefficient E sub K lambda has the spectrum of magnons in bulk. So here is a spectrum, uh, magnum bulk spectrum of the ferromagnetic skirmion crystal uh, at low energy. Um, and for each band, we can compute the churn number to characterize its topology. Again, this is defined in reciprocal space. And as you can see there in the expression, it uses that Bogle Bob transformation matrix. This is rather boring and I like to use colors. So let me pretty it up a little bit for you. So here I am highlighting a set of bands that look, that look fairly flat across momentum. And uh, in yellow, I'm showing the turn numbers associated to those bands. And you can see it's zero. So these are topologically trivial bands. Um, moreover, you can see um, that those magnum modes correspond to uh, distortions of each of the skirmions forming the crystal and that uh, have polygonal deformations. And the, there's an integer that can be used to uh, characterize them, just this M um, that is the uh, um, azimuthal um, quantum number. So uh, this is not the only interesting feature of this spectrum. There's also uh, three important modes that can be accessed by an external applied magnetic field. And these are the well-known anti-clockwise breathing and clockwise mode. Uh, here I'm showing what the spin wave distortion looks like. We decided to study how the spectrum evolves or changes as a function of the magnetic field. So here I'm showing uh, four panels from left to right. I'm increasing the external magnetic field. And you can notice already that, for example, the flat bands tend to be shifted upwards as they increase the magnetic field. But, and um, the other bands tend to do so as well, but there are two that do something funny. So here, just a guide to the eye, you can see that the anti-clockwise and the breathing mode, they get closer and closer together as I increase the magnetic field. Interestingly, they have observed such a behavior using magnetic resonance 
in bulk copper oxide selenide, which is an electrically insulating multiferroic magnet. And in the Skirman crystal phase, shown uh, on the left, uh, encircled by that, by that oval, the, the two modes that I just mentioned, the breathing and the anticlockwise, are getting closer as the magnetic field increases. But they stop short of, of, of becoming degenerate because in the case of a bulk sample, as in this experiment, a new phase takes over and becomes the ground state. So the Skirman crystal no longer is the ground state. However, our model is better suited to describe an effectively two-dimensional system, so a thin film sample. So let's see what happens in our case. So this is the, the, the main result. As we increase the magnetic field further, we have that these two bands actually touch at a critical field shown in the middle panel. And uh, if we keep increasing the magnetic field beyond the critical field, the gap opens again, and there's an inversion of those two bands. So the breathing mode and the anti-clockwise mode, they switch places. Not only that, if we look at the turn numbers for each of the bands, we can see that in the leftmost panel, both the breathing and the anticlockwise mode have a turn number of plus one, but in the rightmost one, at a field higher than the critical one, there's been a transfer of turn number from the breathing from the uh, low energy to the higher energy band. So now, uh, let me see if this works. So now this band has turn number zero and this one has two. So we call this face uh, the trivial one and the one on the left, the topological one for the following reason. So let me briefly tell you about this bulk edge correspondence. So um, it's possible to connect the bulk band topology and the number and winding of the topologically protected edge states that can be realized within a given gap of the spectrum of magnets. And the equation that relates them is the one that I'm showing below in blue. So if you wanna know the number of topologically protected edge states within a given gap, you need to sum the turn numbers below that gap. So let's go back to our um, spectra. So on the leftmost panel, you see that in this gap that I just highlighted, shown in green, below it, there are three bands. And if I add the turn numbers, I would get zero plus zero plus one, that'll be plus one. So it's expected to have there a topologically protected, a single topologically protected magnetic edge state. But in the rightmost panel, above that critical magnetic field, um, because of the turn number transfer, there's no edge state, topologically protected edge state to be expected. We need to check this, and we did that by studying a system that has boundaries. So here we put our infinite scrum and crystal in a strip geometry. So the top and the bottom are just where the strip terminates, and this is supposed to extend to infinity to the left and to the right. And highlighted in yellow is the new magnetic unit cell. I should point out also that even though here we have sample termination at the top and at the bottom, it could also be possible to realize such a situation where you have instead of vacuum, a topologically trivial texture such as a fully polarized state. So let me explain now what happens in, in this gap that I highlighted in green before. So in the leftmost panel, you see that gap again highlighted in green. And in the middle panel, I'm showing the magnetic unit cell for the strip geometry. So indeed, when we recompute the spectrum, we find a blue and a red state within that gap. And you can notice that the blue state has a positive slope and the red state has a negative slope. When we compute the wave function and we plot it in real space, that's the content in the rightmost panel, you can see that the blue state, which is with positive slope, is localized at the top edge, 
and the red one, which has negative slope, it's localized at the bottom. So the slope tells you the propagation direction that I'm showing with these arrows. So indeed, we obtain a chiral magnetic edge state within this gap below the critical field. So to conclude this first part, I told you that the, the ferromagnetic schema crystal has an interesting spectrum. It has nearly flat bands, which correspond to uh, localized modes that have zero turn number. And that there's a topological phase transition that can be accessed by a, an external magnetic field, which involves the anti-clockwise and the breathing mode. And this gives us a handle to potentially control switch on and off the chiral magnetic edge states that could be realized in that gap. And a possible uh, system where we could potentially observe such a topological phase transition is uh, thin films of copper oxide selenide. So as I promised, the message of this part was that Skirman crystals support topological edge states for robust magnetic field controllable magnet spin currents with reduced joule heating. It's very important that um, to realize this idea of joule heating being reduced, uh, the system that would work best is one that is electrically insulating, such as, for example, copper oxide selenide. So, so far, I've told you a lot about a two-dimensional system that has topological magnons along the edge. Uh, this edge has one dimension less than the dimension of the sample. It's a one-dimensional edge. And this is nowadays called a first order topological magnetic insulator in two dimensions because the topological states emerge in one dimension less in the boundaries that have one dimension less in the dimensionality of the sample. But recently, there's been um, a lot of work extending this notion. And that brings us to the possibility of a second order topological magnetic insulator, which would correspond to, in a 2D sample, the boundaries with two dimensions less than the sample. In this case, it would be zero dimensional corners can host topological states. And in the next, in the second part of this talk, I would like to convince you that a uh, fruitful platform to observe such novel states um, is the magnetic anti crystal. So here I'm showing the texture of a magnetic anti crystal. And the main message of the second part is that a magnetic, uh, magnetic quadruple topological insulators support robust corner states that can be realized in anti crystals. crystals. Uh, we got very excited um, when we were studying this um, problem because the, the anti crystal crystals had already been realized experimentally in Hoysler compounds, uh, as shown here um, using Lorentz transmission electron microscopy. This is work from the group of Stuart Parkin. And I am highlighting in those uh, boxes, yellow boxes, uh, the edge of the sample. And you can see there are some objects appearing there, which, are, which uh, are going to be important for our considerations. So here, um, I'm showing again the texture of the anti crystal and highlighted with this dashed rectangle is the magnetic unit cell of this magnetic texture. Uh, the symmetries that this magnetic texture has are going to be of importance in this discussion of higher order topological magnons because um, they are going to be the protecting symmetries required for the realization of uh, corner states. So let me work you through um, uh, what these symmetries mean. So uh, there's uh, three of them, um, which are in-plane 
two fold rotations followed by time reversal uh, along the X and Y axis that I'm highlighting in with this black lines here. And these are the two most important, the two important ones, although there's another symmetry, which is a twofold rotation about the center of the magnetic unit cell. So schematically, uh, what this operation does is here, I'm showing a schematic of the antiskermian texture of the magnetic unit cell. And if we have a twofold rotation about this axis, the Y axis, we end up with this other uh, spin configuration. And if we then apply time reversal, which flips the spins, we recover the original magnetic unit cell. And something similar takes place for, with the um, twofold rotation about the X axis followed by time reversal. So I'm showing here the bulk magnum uh, spectrum of the antiskermian crystal. And as before, there's also a gap that hosts edge states, which is this one here, that I'm denoting with this first order TI. But also, there's a lower energy gap down here. That is the one where corner states are going to be realized. And we're going to focus a lot on this gap. So let me uh, point out again why those objects along the edge were of importance to us. Um, when there's Yeloshinsky Maria interaction in the system, the edge of the system tends to, the texture tends to acquire a twist. Uh, and that has, has been discussed in literature, for example, here in this paper. And that twisting leads to an instability. There's a critical magnetic field below which um, striped domains can enter into the sample. If there's nothing to stop those striped domains, they just penetrate and invade the sample, as in the simulation shown in the middle. But if there's already a, an antiskermum crystal in the bulk, and those striped domains try to enter into the sample, because of the mutual repulsion, there's going to be a stabilized object along the edge, which carries a fractional topological charge. And we call those fractional antiskermans that are edge localized. I should point out that even though it seemed promising that um, in this nature paper from Stuart Parkins group, there's um, these objects along the edge, they, they, they told us that these are not carrying fractional topological charge but they also gave us hope that other systems, other Hoistlers could be um, uh, realized and those could have those fractional anti along the edge. <clears throat> so now I'm showing you um, two rows of, um, of results. So the top one is showing on the left the uh, magnetic texture of an anti crystal confined to a finite size sample, just a square. And this is below the critical field so that the fractional anti along the edge are indeed present. And when we compute the magnonic spectrum within that gap that I advertised before, we find surprisingly these four degenerate states. And these indeed, when we look at the wave function, they are corner localized, as shown on this panel. That is very remarkable. But if we are at a higher magnetic field where there's no fractional anti skirmish along the edge, as in this example in the bottom row, the, within this gap, we do not have such corner localized states. And what is possible to see in the spectrum is that even though um, there's some states close to the gap that have some localization near the corner, there's also some leaking into the bulk of the system. So these are not really 
corner localized magnetic states. So it is, uh, so we can conclude that it's crucial for the realization of these corner states to have those fractional antiscarmers along the edge. We confirm this by studying the magnetic field dependence of those corner states within this gap. And indeed, we observe that they emerge below the critical field, which is right about here. So below this critical field in red, uh, I'm showing those corner states that enter into this gap. And um, the color coding here at the bottom corresponds to the different textures that are realized for those magnetic fields. And they are shown uh, above. So, and it corresponds again that below this critical field, those fractional antiscarmers start to enter into, um, to be localized along the edges. So what we think is happening here is that uh, due to the self-assembly of those fractional antiscarmers along the edge, um, the corner states can be realized. And why? Because that's how those crystalline symmetries that I discussed before can be recovered. We further confirm our results by studying how disorder um, messes with those corner states. Here, what we, what we are showing is the average spectrum over many realizations of disorder for each disorder strength eta, we compute the spectrum and the disorder is modeled as a magnetic field in space that is random, randomly distributed. And we can see that for a high fraction uh, of disorder strength, up to 10% of the, of the magnetic field applied, we still have those corner localized states within this gap. So these are quite robust corner states. So, so far, I've told you that in uh, antiscarmon crystals below the critical magnetic field so that fractional antiscarmons can be stabilized along the edges, corner states emerge within this gap um, highlighted here. So what is behind this um, remarkable result is a topological invariant, which is the bulk quadruple moment. And in the presence of the symmetries that I discussed earlier, the bulk quadruple moment gets quantized to a fraction of one half. So I will now um, go over the calculation of this uh, uh, invariant. And I should say here that we use the machinery of nested Wilson loops, which are objects defined in reciprocal space. These are reciprocal space invariants. But uh, to spur you the technical details, I am going to explain the physical consequences of such invariant. So the Wilson loop is another um, useful, convenient way of computing the position operator in a subspace of uh, bands. And the subspace that is of important, importance to us is the one of, of uh, defined by the bands below this gap. So this is a gap where the corner states appear. Below this gap, this is the subs these are the bands that define the subspace we're interested in. So when we look at the magnetic unit cell and we study the position of uh, the eigenstates of the position operator in that subspace, we find that the magnets um, uh, spatially separate in two sectors, to the left and to the right of the magnetic unit cell, depicted here in blue and red. And uh, because of the crystalline symmetry, the uh, occupation of each of those sectors is uh, equal. And that leads to a zero 
component, zero um, x component of the polarization, p sub x. If we now um, study what happens to the system within each subsector, uh, shown here in this panel, and we now compute the y uh, component of the position operator within each subsector, we find that now there's a different situation. There's indeed a preferred um, position for the magnets that gives rise to these sector polarizations. And this already smells like a quadruple moment because you have two parallel dipoles that are spatially separated uh, along the direction perpendicular to them. Um, a similar analysis can be done for the case of the Y component of the polarization. And we also find that thanks to this, these crystalline symmetries, it vanishes. So there's no bulk polarization, but the quadruple moment is um, indeed quantized and has a value of one half. There's a measurable, measurable uh, quantity that is a consequence of this um, quantized magnetic uh, quadruple moment, and that is the magnetic corner charge. And I'm using charge in between quotes because it's not a true charge. It's actually a difference between magnet occupation numbers. So in this panel, uh, I'm showing the texture in a finite size system of an antiscarbon crystal. Uh, and you can see that I'm highlighting the magnetic unit cells. For the system, when we compute the spectrum, this is what we get. We indeed have those four corner localized magnetic states. And if we then compute the, this in between quotes charge density, which is given by the charge at the edge so the magnet occupation, occupation at the edge minus the magnet occupation in the bulk, we get that um, it is indeed corner localized and that opposite corners have the same value and uh, you have negative and positive ones. When you add within each magnetic unit cell this charge, magnet charge in between quotes density, we get surprisingly that in the magnetic unit cells that correspond to the corners, they have a value of one half or minus one half. So this is the measurable consequence of this quadruple moment quantization. Um, there's another possibility to measure uh, the corner states and that could be by applying an external magnetic field, either in plane or out of plane. So in the top plot, I'm showing the uh, imaginary part of the susceptibility, magnetic susceptibility, and you see two peaks that correspond to uh, bulk modes, mainly the anti-clockwise and breathing mode. Those are expected as well in the case of anti-skerman crystals. But there's also a tiny peak at lower energy that corresponds to the corner states. And we can confirm that using uh, Landau Lipschitz Gilbert simulations. When we excite at that energy of this tiny peak, we indeed observe that the corner states get excited. So even though maybe a magnetic resonance uh, is not, could potentially not resolve this tiny peak, it, another alternative is to measure um, the corner states in real space to image them. And there are several techniques that have the necessary spatial resolution to do that. For example, spin polarized scanning tunneling microscopy, um, nitrogen vacancy uh, magnetometry, uh, also brutal light scattering uh, with the help of near field techniques. And um, also scan, scanning transmission X-ray microscopy. Finally, we also looked at the possibility to realize magnetic corner states, not just at the sample corners, but also within the bulk by engineering corners there 
And I, we tried several ways, but the easiest one that we found is having a T-shaped hole. So here on the left, I'm showing such a T-shaped hole. When we compute the spectrum, we indeed find in the corresponding gap two states, and they are, as shown on the right, corner localized at the corners, the inner corners of this T-shaped hole. So um, as a conclusion of the second part, I told you that antiscrimon crystals can indeed support manganic quadruple topological insulator, insulators, whose hallmark is um, that they support corner states, um, and that the bulk invariant behind that is this quadruple moment that leads to an important observable, which is this corner charge in between quotes that gets um, a value of one half. And I also mentioned that the fractional anti experiments along the edge are essential to the realization of the topologically protected corner states. So to uh, sum up, uh, again, the main message of the second part is magnetic quadruple topological insulators support robust corner states and can be realized in anti crystals. And now I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very, uh, very much, Sebastian, for this interesting talk. Um, so we can now take questions. If you have a question, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom. You'll find it uh, at the bottom of the participants panel. If you can't find it, uh, send me a private chat. Uh, if you're watching on Twitch, you can type in your uh, questions in the chat window. You need to have a Twitch account to be able to do that. Uh, so the first question uh, will come from uh, Alexei Kovalev. Please go ahead. Hello. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, in your discussion, symmetries play a very important role and I believe they should also be present at the edge of your sample. So how would you like realize this experimentally? How would you respect these symmetries at the edge of your sample? So I, I believe it, the symmetries should also be not broken at the edge. So you clearly have, have to cut your crystal carefully. Thank you for this interesting question. It is true, the crystalline symmetries in the case of the, the corner states in anti scrumian crystals are important. And um, when we, well, we thought about this and we came to the following conclusion. Uh, because the, below the critical field for this edge instability, the anti scrumians of fractional charge that merge along the edge tend to be repelled by those that are in the bulk. They kind of self-assemble and they, they arrange the system, putting it back to this crystalline um, form that respects those symmetries. Uh, you may be referring to roughness uh, along the edges of the sample, if I understood correctly. Um, in, in those yeah, cases, to destroy that crystallinity, and that could be detrimental to these edge, um, to these corner states, for sure. But there's also, as you know, um, a leeway, right? So if it's not too rough, um, they should um, uh, be present. And that's what we confirmed using our um, disorder analysis. So that disorder analysis, in a way, models uh, in a simple way, roughness along the edges. So if I, if I can go back to that slide. So basically, does it mean that your skirmance should be very large on the scale of uh, atomic length so that you could kind of uh, not be uh, under influence of uh, edge roughness so much? Uh, that could be a possibility. Um, for sure, uh, but as I said, um, there's always, always a leeway. Uh, it's um, possible to distort a bit. So roughness 
would lead to distortions in the texture. And we model those distortions by including this. Um, no, but symmetry is either present or not. Then in your discussion, symmetry is not so important. That means or it's like there are not no two ways. Symmetry is either there or not, right? You can slightly break it though, right? Uh, but then it's not there. If it's slightly broken, it's not there. Then you cannot, strictly speaking, uh, discuss it as a symmetry. So in the case that um, when I discussed the bulk invariance, that symmetry has to be there, of course. But as you uh, consider a finite size system where near the edge and only a little bit near the edge, you slightly break that symmetry, it is indeed still possible to see. So, so you're saying that at the edge symmetry does not need to be. I'm saying that it can be slightly broken. Um, all right, okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Isaac uh, Harris, next question, please. Hello, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, is there any reason that you only talk about corner states and corner modes and anti skirmion crystals? Are there any corner or yeah, corner states in skirmion crystals? Thank you for this question. Um, yeah, there's a reason. So we also have results for corner states in finite size systems that have uh, Bloch and uh, Nell ferromagnetic skirmions. Unfortunately, we we haven't been able to find any experimental uh, observation of the fractional, excuse me, skirmions along the edge. So in the interest of connecting to uh, an experimentally available system, we focused on anti skirmions but it's indeed possible to, it could be potentially possible to realize those um, fractional skirmions along the edge. One thing that is important to consider is that uh, that would be highly dependent on the thickness of the sample. In the case of Hoistlers, which support anti skirmions the, the Yelofinsky-Maria interaction is of D to D symmetry. So the, the Hoistler has a D to D symmetry that, in, that then um, results in a special kind of Yelofinsky-Maria interaction which is different from the one that is realized in ferromagnetic skirmions. And the one from ferromagnetic skirmions tends to um, um, have an impact on the stability of the skirmions when you make thicker and thicker samples. Okay, thank you. Okay, Dennis Candido, next question please. Uh, hello, Sebastian. Uh, so we know that regarding topological insulators, uh, we could say at least in some cases that the spin orbit coupling is uh, the required uh, ingredient to have the band inversion and uh, as well the topological edge state and everything um, consequently. And so uh, here my question is, what is the ingredient uh, behind the uh, skirmions or anti skirmions that it's required uh, to have this corner or edge states? So, um, thank you for the question. The ingredient is um, ultimately also spin orbit coupling because um, the Yurofinska Maria interaction, this um, spin spin interaction that favors this canting of the spins, which leads to this texture of skirmions, is or originally comes from a combination of spin orbit and, um, and a lack of inversion symmetry. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, if there are further questions, please raise your hand. Um, in the meantime, let me ask you about uh, the, the pictures that you showed for the um, 
for the structure of those uh, flat bands in the spectrum. Yeah. So first of all, uh, do there always have to be flat bands? And then I didn't quite quite understand what is shown. Is that um, this is light? Yeah. Is this uh, is this in reciprocal space? This is in reciprocal space. Uh, so, w what does this uh, polygonal symmetry represent? How should I think about these localized modes? And 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 again, do they always have to be uh, present? So, um, in the GIFs, I'm showing the distortion that you get from these spin wave modes, these magnum modes, at the gamma point, to be precise. So, what you should imagine is that the whole, at the gamma point, the whole Skirmian crystal um, has this distortion. So, let's focus, for instance, in this band with m equals 2. Each Skirmian would be distorted like so, and they would execute this uh, rotation. And as you go higher in energy, you find that there are other distortions with, with increasing number of vertices for the polygons. And these are fairly localized to the core of the skirmion, of each of the skirmions. That's why we think that they carry zero turn number. So if this thing is localized, uh, the, the picture you're showing is, is in reciprocal space, correct? So what I'm showing, thank you for that question too. Let me clarify. So the spectrum shown in the middle of the slide is in reciprocal space. So energy versus crystal momentum in yeah, the yeah. first. But, but, but these colored pictures. Yeah. The GIFs are a real space representation of what those modes would look like. The real space, but what, what is shown then? What, what quantity is shown? Um, this is the, the spin configuration, including the distortion that comes from the spin, uh, from the magnum modes. So it's some way of color coding for the spin direction? Uh, I'm so sorry. So um, this is a top-down view of a single skirmion. For instance, let's focus here. In blue, you have um, spins pointing mostly down and in red, mostly up. Mm. Okay. All right, so, so, so each skirmion uh, undergoes some, some sort of deformation um, of a polygonal shape? Is that That's correct. Okay, I see. Thank you. Uh, Mohammed Hamdi, next question, please. Yeah, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, uh, I ju it's just related to the previous question. I, for me, it seems the it, as far as you go with the higher M, you have kind of parameter excitation of the parameter of this skirmion. Is it the correct picture? Um, what parameter do you mean? So uh, parameter, the, the, the uh, surrounding of the skirmion goes to higher and higher, let's say nodes and uh, belly something like this it's like a standing wave around the skirmion with higher and higher nodes do you mean the perimeter yes yes sorry, uh, <laughs> sorry. yeah um sorry um thank you for the question yes so there's a way to um analyze those modes as uh if you consider that a single skirmion forget about the the crystal if you have a single skirmion um, you can define a domain wall that inserts it, where you have this transition between down pointing to upward pointing spins. And uh, small distortions of such a domain wall can be, um, can fit these polygonal distortions. So what I'm saying here is that at the gamma point where every skirmion of the crystal is the same, for all intents and purposes, uh, you get this, uh, this polygonal distortion for the skirmions for each of those flat bands. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. But I guess the, the, the question was, uh, 
is it reasonable to think about it uh, as um, some sort of standing waves with uh, with uh, nodes or a certain number of uh, half wavelengths along the perimeter and and also related to that what what if there's just one skarmion in 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 a ferromagnetic matrix not not a crystal but just one skarmion is it going to have similar sort of uh, excitations yes we have studied that case as well so when you have an isolated skarmion in a ferromagnetic background um, you get these modes as well, these distortions. So is it, is it fair to think about them as a wave that's running around the... Uh... Uh, I, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Um, it looks like uh, there are no more questions. So let's uh, thank Sebastian. Uh, we can use uh, the clap button and the reactions panel. Uh, so thank you very much. There's there's one more question I think in the chat box. Um, yeah, Huangyu um, Hu, please go ahead. Yeah, sorry for interruptions and thanks for the nice talk. So, um, is the Chun number of flat bands always zero, or is this special for this specific system? So thank you for the question. We have. Um, studied how the flat bands um, change as we modify the magnetic field. And so far, for all our calculations, they, at least for those that I'm showing here, in the lower part of the spectrum, they are always topologically trivial, carrying a turn number of zero. And we think that the reason for that is that they are localized modes. I see. Thanks for the answer. All right. Um, looks like Alexei Kovalev has another question. Please go ahead. Uh, just in the context of this, like, so we could also have Landau levels here. Uh, so, so could there be confusion between these flat bands and Landau levels, perhaps, which are, could also be flat, but OK, because the fictitious field is non-uniform. Maybe they will be dispersive. Um, yeah, that's an interesting way to analyze this. There are analogies, as you, I'm sure, well aware, uh, between the the uh, um, modes for magnons in in Skarman crystals and uh, Landau level physics for electrons, because of the the flux that each of the Skarmans bring to the table. But I. I'm not prepared to answer this question. I think I need to think more about it. OK. Any yeah, further questions? All right. So I don't see any further questions, either in Twitch nor in Zoom. So thank you, Sebastian, again for this uh, nice talk. Um, we are going to stop the recording.